Good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine Bruce, and I'm the executive director of Planet in Focus. I'm the executive director of Planet in Focus. Sorry about my camera. It's our extreme pleasure tonight to be honoring uh, Cheyenne Sundance with our 2020 Planet in Focus Rob Stewart Eco Hero Award. Before we begin, um, I'd like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas, of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anish Anishinaabe and the Huron-Wendat. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. I'd also like to direct you to our YouTube channel um, where Elder Kat Krieger, who has done a lot of uh, our land acknowledgements at festivals in the past, has done a really beautiful um, land acknowledgement video for us that's on our 2020 festival playlist for the um, for um, the Planet Focus YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Um, so anyway, as I said, tonight it's our extreme pleasure to be honoring Shay and Sundance with our 2020 Planet in Focus Rob Stewart Eco Hero Award. Cheyenne is the owner and manager of Sundance Harvest, a year-round urban farm in Toronto, Ontario, that's rooted in food justice. Sundance Harvest grows a variety of produce, offers a farm school, and runs a free educational program called Growing in the Margins for Low-Income Youth, who are a part of a marginalized group, Black Indigenous people of color, LGBTQTS, and youth with disabilities. Um, the farm is absolutely incredible and we could not be more excited to, to be honoring her here tonight. She will be in conversation with um, another incredible food justice advocate, Letitia Diawu, who we're delighted to welcome back to Planet in Focus. I would also note that her short film, Healing Our Community, Black Creek Community Farm, is part of our official um, Planet and Focus film program this year, so please check that out as well. Letitia is the director of the Black Creek Community Farm, Toronto's largest urban farm, and as director of the Black Creek Community Farm, Letitia engages residents, allies, and other stakeholders in struggles for uh, social and economic justice, food security, and food justice in the Jane Finch community. I'm really looking forward to the conversation with um, Cheyenne and Letitia, and thank you to everyone for being with us here tonight for this conversation. Thank you so much, Catherine, for that introduction. I am also super, super excited to be um, honoring uh, Cheyenne today and also uh, for this uh, important conversations where we get to learn a little bit about the work that uh, Cheyenne is doing with uh, Sundance Harvest. So Cheyenne, congratulations. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Leticia. Thank you, Planet in Focus. I was really jazzed to hear that I got this award. I actually haven't won any awards for my work and this is my first one. Uh, so I'm very happy. <laughs> Congrat congratulations. I'm really, really excited to be celebrating this with you. So um, let's start. Uh, maybe, um, you know, I know a little bit about your work, but for folks who probably are just hearing about you and some of the work that you're doing, you want to tell us a little bit about your background and why you started Sundance Harvest? Yeah, sure. So I have a very short and fun slide that I'm going to be sharing right now. Um, and that actually talks a bit about Sundance Harvest and how I run my farm. So first you can see a picture of me, very exuberant and happy, having a really great time. Um, and that's me, of course. So Sundance Harvest is a year round vegetable farm located in Toronto, Ontario. Um, and you may think, oh, a farm in the city. Yes, that's Sundance. Um, and the really cool thing about being year round is I actually can utilize greenhouses and greenhouses and hoop houses, in my opinion, are a really big missing piece for a food system because you can grow food year round in the city and to do so, uh, you really should be utilizing a greenhouse as well. So Sundance Harvest uh, has lots of produce that I grow, but beyond just produce, I also do things like I run programs. Uh, a program I run is called Growing in the Margins and 
Growing in the Margins is a 12 week mentorship or a drop in for youth who are marginalized within the food system. But more so, I would say I'm a farm who grows a lot of food and ideally wants to be a pilot um, or even an example for people who face similar barriers to myself in the food system. So as a farm, I really wanted to ensure that I wasn't just going to grow food and think that just because I had representation that was making great change. I do think that representation of Black femmes and BIPOC femmes, um, BIPOC means Black Indigenous Persons of Color, and I'm going to be using that acronym throughout this talk. Um, representation obviously matters, but I really wanted to be able to have my farm plant a seed to ensure that everyone else can get a harvest. And by that, what I mean is Sundance Harvest actually acts more like an incubator farm where I mentor tens of projects a year and many of those projects become farms. So I want to address uh, food injustice found in the, in the food system by having both my farm being a great example of success um, but also about programming that uplift and support young new farmers of color um, and young new queer farmers, trans farmers, non-binary and two-spirit farmers as well. And in the photo behind, those are my lovely tomatoes. I grow uh, amazing greens in the spring, fall and winter, and I grow lots of herbs. And then in the summer, I grow cherry tomatoes, exclusively cherry tomatoes, which is really fun. So that's a bit about uh, what Sundance Harvest does regarding growing. So as a year on farm, I really try to show people that there's ways you can do it um, in an intensive way. Many people, when they think about farming, especially young people, I'm 23. And when I wanted to get into farming, all of my friends said, there's no way to make a living in it, especially in the city, considering lease is very expensive to so lease spaces to farm. But if you have a year round farm, the cool thing is, you, there's a big gap in the food system in the winter. So I found that Sundance Harvest really shined in the winter time because I had amazing sweet lettuce and sorrel and kale. I was at the farmer's market and people were like, whoa, where did this come from? And I was like, my greenhouse, literally like eight kilometers away. So having a year round farm, I think also gave a lot of more youth in my programs an idea that they can do it as well. Um, seasonal work in agriculture, especially urban agriculture, is so prevalent. So a lot of youth end up not having a job in the winter. And to expect um, someone who in the past have had a hard time getting employment to just not work in the winter time isn't really feasible. So I want to show Sundance Harvest as a year-round farm to let people know that they can still farm and make an income the whole year round. And in this photo, you can see some sorrel. Um, it's not the sorrel you make fruit punch with, which I get asked all the time. Uh, it's just red vein sorrel, and I also grow green sorrel. This is a perennial. I actually highlight most of my vegetables are perennials because I like to um, incorporate them in my farming practice because I find they're more healthier. And also as a farm, I, I don't use any pesticides whatsoever, not even organic pesticides. And what I tend to do is just release ladybugs. I should call my farm the ladybug farm because I have like six or eight thousand ladybugs right now living in my farm. It's a bit ridiculous, but they eat all the aphids. So that way I don't have to spray any pesticides and my soil is extremely healthy. I feed it lots of worm compost. So there's many ways you can farm in the city in an ecological way. And I'm really excited that my farm has been doing that. So growing the margins. So growing the margins is my pride and joy of Sundance Harvest. If someone were to say, what are you most proud of? Probably would not be Sundance. It'd probably be this program. Uh, growing the margins started because for myself, I could not find one place in all of Ontario to learn about farming from a farmer or a farm that had a food justice or even an ethical outlook on farming. The idea, the colonial idea of farming is to extract and take from the land and not give something back. And concepts like permaculture are actually indigenous food ways that were co-opted by settlers who did not have a relationship to the land in the first place. So Growing the Margins really is a place for young farmers of color or soon to be farmers of color uh, who are low income and youth aged 18 to 25 to have an opportunity to have community and to grow their projects and also themselves. Um, the really cool thing about Growing the Margins is I usually have the mentorships in the fall and winter. So those are the times when there's not a lot of farming happening, but because I have a greenhouse, it means a lot of the youth get to go somewhere in the winter. So when you know seasonal depression kicks in, they get to come to my greenhouse and learn how to farm. Um, and because it's a mentorship, I actually help them with their projects in particular. So when a youth wants to apply to Growing the Margins in the fall or winter cohort, 
they send me a cover letter. And in that cover letter, it talks a bit about what their project is, their dreams and their hopes, and also the barriers that they have faced in the food system wanting to be a farmer or something like that. So I take that project and I help them for 12 whole weeks, each week uh, talking to them and learning more about them. And by the 12th week, what I do usually is I say, do you want to work in agriculture or start your own project? Some of them want to work in agriculture. For example, my friend Echo, who is the one standing up here in this photo, now works at Foodshare and manages a two acre farm along my friend Adam, right? That's a pretty big deal. And it's happened the year after they did Growing in the Margins. And another person in this photo, Adjua, now works uh, with Parkdale Green Thumb Enterprises in Toronto, uh, planting amazing pollinator plants and working on a rooftop farm. So Growing in the Margins really helps catalyze youth from not having the skills and also not having the community to actually getting their farm started. Many of my participants this year are actually starting amazing projects. One of them wants to start a community composting hub. Another one wants to start a really cool mushroom farming uh, business. There's so many interesting new projects these youths want to start. And the biggest thing that they said was there was no one who looked like themselves to teach them these skills. We can't expect Black youth to go out to Guelph or Milton to learn how to farm so far away from their community and also support network. Um, because that's not simply ethical and also just. It's very important. I noticed that youth, especially Black youth, were learning from someone who has similar lived experiences on land. Um, it's not, it's pretty obvious to say that Black and Indigenous people face the most food insecurity and also land-based oppression in Canada. So when they're not, especially when youth are not taught by the, their own community, you're going to find that big disconnect. I really found some meaningful relationships with all of the youth in Growing the Margins, and I have tens of youth each year that are mentored by me. And almost all of them have said that it's been a magical and transformative process because I was listening to them and I was hearing them, but also I have a very similar lived experience to them. And I always say to them, Mother Earth was the scene of the crime, never the perpetrator. So when we're thinking about the transatlantic slave trade, when we're thinking about colonial genocide of indigenous people that's currently ongoing, um, Mother Earth didn't cause that. So it's very important to really center yourself in that peace and understand that you can heal. Um, but more, more so than not, having the community is the biggest thing I've noticed. And I'm really grateful and honored to be mentoring these youth who I think are the radical change makers of the future. And this photo, I took it about a week ago, one of our field trips. Uh, there's Aaliyah on the right, and there's Temple, there's Hermela, and there's Fatia, and they're all amazing people. So I also do a drop-in. So besides the mentorship, I understand that many youth face barriers. Not everyone has the capacity or can even do a 12-week program. Um, so what I tend to do is I do a drop-in every now and then. I do an online workshop too, just to make it more accessible as much as I can. And then of course, I understand that just because they have the education, that doesn't mean that there's no more barriers. So after they're done their program, they actually get micro grants from Sundance Harvest and they can start their own projects with that funding. So I directly fund their projects. So why I started Sundance Harvest? You might be like, oh, why didn't you work on someone else's farm or maybe worked at a nonprofit? I could not see exactly what I wanted to see anywhere else, so I started it. I believe that I don't want a seat at the table. I want my own table. I want to build that table. I want to carve that table and I want to sit at that table. So I started Sundance Harvest because I knew that what I was craving in the food system, which was in my opinion, an urban farm that did more than just grow food, but it also grew projects and I could really have control in, in my own say. Um, I didn't see that. So I started that. And that's really as simple as it is. I started Sundance Harvest literally, I think a year and a half ago. So it's a really big baby. <laughs> But I went to Cuba when I was 18 for a bit and I was hanging out in this tobacco farm, I was growing cabasa root, tobacco, collard greens, um, a lot of cool vegetables. And it was about a five acre farm and I did all of it by hand and with ox and there's lots of chickens. And basically I learned a lot about communal agriculture because it was a really big socialist farm in the area of Vinales, Cuba. And I learned about how to farm organically. And also I learned about livestock but after the very end of it, I learned more about food justice and also that there simply is enough food. And many people think that food insecurity is law caused by a lack of food. It's not, it's caused by a lack of income. So if people aren't fairly compensated, people don't have a fair income, they're really gonna have disparity amongst their neighbors with food. So I would say that's very important. And I learned most of my politics in Cuba. And then I took that over here 
and I eventually settled down in Toronto in my early 20s and I started Sundance Harvest when I was 22 years old. Um, so that was a really big thing. Why I started Sundance Harvest? I simply wanted to see an example of a farm in the city that I didn't see at the moment. So a lot of people, I'm also in the organic food world, mention that growing food is so radical. I think growing food itself isn't radical. I think why and how the person is doing it is. Um, to grow food on Turtle Island and not make relationships with local indigenous nations, I don't think is radical. I think what's even more radical is to give that land back and also have a direct conversation about what that looks like stewarding the land. I think it's important to always cement yourself in the food system and see where you are in reflection to also where your privileges are in. Um, I experienced some privileges in the food system that I have this mobility to have a farm and have it running. Um, but I also understand that not everyone has the same options as me. So whenever anyone's interested in getting into the food system, really think about who's not at the table and why they aren't there. And then try to be an ally or work with um, other people in the food system to create those opportunities so they can actually be where you are as well. So a lot of people often ask me, well, why is growing in the margins uh, specifically for Black and Indigenous youth? And I always pull up this uh, data because I feel like data really speaks fairly, probably better than I would. So um, U of T has a department called Proof and Proof found out in 2017 that Black and Indigenous people face the most food insecurity across Canada in a very, very high number in terms of our populations. So I would say that I truly do think with Sundance Harvest, the biggest thing I can provide isn't low cost food. Uh, that is valuable and that is very important to provide to people. Um, I don't think that's a band-aid at all. I think that's actually something that people need every day is food. But what I do think I can do better, th better instead of just providing low cost food is to actually provide free education. And that's why growing the margins is free. I would never ever charge um, free edu uh, I would never charge the education I provide of growing the margins. But I do know as a farm, I don't have the, I guess the financials to provide free produce. I do pay myself a living wage and all my staff a living wage. So I really ensure that instead of providing free food, I actually provide free education. So my youth who take the programs can take that education and do whatever they want with it. They could start a food garden, they could start a rooftop farm, they can just grow food for their family. As long as they have that education, I find that they can pass that on to the next generation. So here's a little bit about what uh, Sundance Harvest kind of focuses on and for the future. So of course, growing projects through growing the margins. I don't want Sundance Harvest to be the only food justice farm in the city, especially the only one for profit. Black Creek Farm and Food Chair, PAX, they all do amazing work. Um, but I've only noticed a very, very small amount of for-profit urban farms. And I think that's also a valuable thing to be a for-profit urban farm. I don't like capitalism, but I do like paying my rent. And I feel like if I have a dignified work and a work that I feel respected in, at least I can wake up every day and be a bit happier. Multi-locational. So my goal for Sundance Harvest next year is to have multi-locations so that way I can reach more youth in more neighborhoods. Right now I'm just in Downsview Park in a greenhouse that's 2,600 square feet and heated. But not all the youth that take my programs are in Downsview Park. Some are in Scarborough, some are in Etobicoke, and some are in Jane and Finch, and they have to commute very far to get to my program. So if I had multi-locations, at least I could have more of a reach, which is something I really want. I want one day to be teaching hundreds of youth a year and then seeing hundreds of projects, and I can only do so much with my limited one location. Prioritizing education models for sovereignty. I truly believe that providing education in an accessible and respectful way to these youth really can catalyze change Almost every single community, any, any single Black and Indigenous community knows what they need to actually get food justice and food sovereignty. Oftentimes we don't have the resources or tools. So really handing down that knowledge, I think is a tool that can actually help forward their own food sovereignty. And then of course, Sundance Harvest partners with and supports Black and Indigenous peoples and organizations with some of the gardens that I have managed, not my farm, but some of the smaller gardens that I've managed for my youth through growing the margins, I've actually am in a process of giving it back to local indigenous nations in Toronto who are doing great work. So that's kind of what Sundance Harvest is moving toward. I also grow tobacco each year in cedar and sage and sweetgrass, and I donate 
that at in solidarity to many Indigenous organizations, peoples, and of course my friends, and Sundance Harvest grows upwards of 500 tobacco seedlings every year to donate to Indigenous gardens. So I think my how I operate as a farm needs to be in constant solidarity with the people of Turtle Island, specifically Tacaronto. And without doing that, I didn't wouldn't feel okay growing food in this area. So that's something that Sunday Tires always focuses on is active participation and communication with Indigenous solidarity and allyship. So that's a bit about Sundance Harvest. I know that was a mouthful, but I hope I covered a lot of the questions that people had about Sundance. No, thank you so much. I'm still, I'm still processing, okay? There is so much that you just shared with folks that you're doing and you started, what, just a year and a half ago? Mm -hmm. And yeah. you're already doing so much and having impact. I think even, like, I've, I've had the opportunity to interact with some of the youth that have also participated in the programs and workshops that you're providing and they all speak about the amazing work that you're doing. I'm still, I'm like, even after the presentation, I'm like, wow, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> oh, what other questions? I think you covered um, a lot of the questions that I was going to ask you, but I think maybe you can elaborate a little bit in terms of um, um, the piece around like, what do you think or what would you say is needed uh, for us to move forward um, into a more just food system. If you can just elaborate just a little bit on that as well. Yeah, so hmm. I'll speak in the urban and rural context, but more so in the urban context. When we're thinking about growing food in the city, um, you only see a handful of farms for profit. That's not because people don't want to grow food, they want to grow food. It's because of uh, classist and racist zoning. It's also because of classist and racist urban planning. Um, the fact that you can really only, only grow food in Toronto if you have a lease, like myself, is baffling to me. In cities like Vancouver and Seattle and Portland, San Francisco, Montreal, all of these cities have bustling urban agriculture policies and also backyard chickens. We don't even have it here in all the wards, which is wild. So I really think the biggest thing is Toronto, where I live right now. The, City of Toronto, the Mayor of Toronto, the MPPs, they need to actually take an initiative to create better zoning for urban agriculture to exist. Some radical people, for example, Food Chair has just opened a farm in Flemington Park and what they have is a thousand square feet plots where the neighbors and community members can grow food but also sell it. And you actually can't, in Toronto, sell food grown on city park land. You can get a fine for that. So the fact that you have low-income people growing community gardens is great, but what if they can't sell the food? And I know a lot of people think, kumbaya, let's not sell the vegetables, but you can't pay your rent in kale. And with the housing crisis actually in full roar in Toronto, without selling your vegetables, you aren't really given a good option. If your choice is working another shift at um, your minimum wage job or taking care of your vegetables, which are you going to do? You're probably not going to be harvesting those vegetables because you need to pay your rent and you need to pay your child care and things like that. So I feel like the tr city of Toronto doesn't do much. We don't have much allotments here. We don't have many um, urban farm spaces here. And I'm saying this as a very, in my opinion, lucky person that I have the availability and the access to lease land. Like, Sundance Harvest has a good business plan, yes, but I've also saved for years and years and years for a farm, and I really relied on those savings, but not everyone has a privilege to have savings like myself, so unless you have savings, you can't have a farm in Toronto, and that's being really strictly honest. Um, it's very difficult, I would say, the city making it easier for people to start those who are low, more low income as well. And then in a rural setting, I would say more grants for underrepresented farmers, specifically farmers of color, specifically, specifically Black and Indigenous farmers to farm uh, rurally. There's a lot of uh, barriers to land access here in Southern Ontario. Land is being developed like wildfire for these McMansions and, the, and farmland is being bold over, like, bold over for condos and like it's really changing and you can't get that farmland back. And I, for example, can't even afford farmland in Southwestern Ontario. I have to look two hours, three hours north. Um, when you're thinking about half a million dollars for 10 acres, that's not a doable thing for really any young farmer unless you have intergenerational wealth. So I would say better grants and loan access for young farmers of color for the rural setting and better zoning for urban ag in the Toronto setting. Thank you so much. I definitely agree. So 
For other young uh, farmers uh, who want to get involved, what would you say is like the first steps that they need to take if they want to get into either uh, farming or urban agriculture as a whole? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. I would say I'm going to answer this for the people that look like me. So people who are racialized, specifically black femmes. Um, and I'm going to talk about that primarily because we have no representation in agriculture for a few reasons. One, when people call Sundance Harvest a garden, that totally erases everything that I've done, my legacy and my future legacy regarding agriculture and the movement. So I would say you're probably not going to find any representation of any Black femme farmer simply because people are inherently racist when they think about who's a farmer. Think about when you close your eyes, who's a farmer? Probably someone who's white, probably someone who owns land, also probably someone that uses migrant workers and exploits them to grow our Driscoll strawberries. Uh, there's things like that too. So we're not going to see someone who looks like me um, when we're thinking about a farmer. So I would say the first thing to do is to find someone who looks like you. I would have never, ever, ever, ever learned to grow food on a farm by someone who had no lived experiences in me because your farm will be curated by how you learn. Your lived experiences learning on that farm for a year, let's say you go to someone's farm and you're working there, will be replicated by what you learn. It's almost like imperative. The most important thing is to ensure that you're getting representative learning and education. So if you can work on a farm by someone who has the same lived experiences as you, do that. That's literally why I started growing the margins because there's no representation and I want to be that mama bear to teach them how to grow food. Um, that's the biggest thing. If you're in an area where you can't find any farmers who represent you at all, then try to go on Instagram, try to go on social media, try to follow these people and make maybe make a bridge that way. But that's the biggest thing. Uh, it's really, really important because you're going to be very um, burnt out and tired emotionally if you don't have that community. The second thing, obviously, is getting education. So it's really hard to farm without actually doing it for at least a season. So what I would say is ensure that you get paid for your labor and work on a farm. I don't believe in unpaid internships. There's been many studies, so many studies um, and reports that come out that say how unfair and exploitative they are. Do we expect there to be an unpaid internship at Starbucks? No. So why does that exist on an organic farm? It just means that farm doesn't have a good business plan. And Sundance Harvest, despite paying a lot of money for my lease, I've never once um, exploited or had an unpaid intern. If anything, I pay myself a living wage because that would be wild. So I would say ensure that you get paid for your work and work on a farm for a year. That really helps a lot. Um, also look into urban ag. Urban ag is flourishing. You may not see many opportunities, but if you look a bit deeper, you can probably find some opportunities. Oh, thank you so much. So for a lot of young people, especially, um, you know, young black people who want to get into farming, sometimes, you know, you hear comments from family and friends saying, why do you want to go back to that? You know, our ancestors, you know, didn't fight for their freedom so that, you know, you can go back into the farmland. What would you say to people that are considering farming, but, you know, are hearing some of these comments or what do you say to people that have, um, you know, that as sort of the idea that why do black people even want to go into farming? We left that not to go back. What would you say to them? I would say, you know, the quote, you are your ancestors' wildest dreams. I would say that you could be your ancestors' wildest dreams and those wildest dreams are pure and total freedom. So having the freedom as a black person to decide to go to farming and having to be supported that is freedom. So I would say that um, to equate not wanting to be like your ancestors is something I would never dream of. I actually aspire and look up to my ancestors. The struggle they had and the, and the perseverance and the resilience they had every day to go through that is something that I honor with me every day when I go farming. Um, I would have never felt ashamed when I farmed and that's because I really understood the background. I understood that like when you're thinking about before slavery, before 400 years of slavery, um, many of my ancestors were actually agrarians. They farmed, they farmed for substance. And when you look at anywhere, for example, in Africa too, many people now, even Jamaica and other places um, in the Caribbean as well, they farm every day to feed their family. Farming is something that every single person's ancestor on the planet did 
thousands of years ago. So I think it's really hard and I don't blame people for not wanting to farm because of horrible um, memories of slavery and intergenerational trauma they hold with them. But I do remind people to think that um, at one time, even before land-based oppression uh, in North America, that everyone's ancestors farmed. And overall, there's many ways you can be involved in agriculture. It doesn't have to be tilling the fields and growing some wheat. It could be making a value-added product, making hot sauce, making jelly, making jam. It could also be just supporting in local policy and local food policy. Uh, but I would say that maybe look deeper into your histories, ask your elders to tell some stories and learn more about your your ancestors in a light that isn't under a colonial white supremacist gaze. Definitely, definitely. I, I definitely agree with you on that one. So um, what is your favorite vegetable to grow and why? Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna say my favorite vegetable is the easiest, which is kale, because I don't <laughs> like tomatoes. I grow tomatoes so the market wants tomatoes. So I listen to the market because that's I, I grow have a business, but kale and chard. Chard is probably my favorite because it's beautiful. My chard is like out of this world, gorgeous. So chard. Chard. Okay, chard is your favorite. <laughs> yeah. I, I you know what? I, I do I didn't know about Swiss chard at all until I started working at the Black Creek Community Farm and I was like, what is this? And what yeah. do you do with it? And I actually put it in a stir fry once and it tasted amazing. So now I'm a fan of Swiss chard, especially the rainbow Swiss chard mm. because I just love the colors and how it looks, um, especially when you put it in your food. So that's, that's definitely um, great. So another question uh, for you is, you know, there's a lot of conversations now, especially since COVID, around Black food sovereignty. Can you elaborate on that? What does Black food sovereignty look like for you? And what do you think um, all levels of government and, and individuals can do to support uh, Black food sovereignty? Oh, that's a big question. Okay, so <laughs> I would say, uh, so I, I would say first and foremost, um, black food, food sovereignty is something that's not a trend, not a buzzword. It's a thing that's tangible in there. Like you've seen in the previous slides that I've shown black and indigenous people face the most food insecurity and land-based oppression in Canada. So not finding a solution to that is injustice and oppression. So black food sovereignty, in my opinion, um, someone who identifies as black is uh, black people having complete and utter control of the food system that they are within. So control of the seed, where they grow, farming practices they, they use, cultural food they have access to, um, and creating their own cooperatives, their own organizations, their own businesses, and not having to deal with racism, um, and also not having to deal with colonial forces trying to dismantle it. That's what I think, complete and utter control. That's the, literally what the word sovereignty means, to be sovereign, to be in control of oneself or one state. So I would say that. Um, I would say, speaking on the macro level with the government and on the feds, mm, so with the feds, um, what I would say is that I personally, Sunday and Harvest, maybe people ask me this, because they're like, oh, the work you do seems very helpful. I don't get any fed money. Sunday and Harvest doesn't really like that. Um, I actually don't get funded by anyone except for independent donors, which usually reach out to me. And that's because I want the most complete and utter control of Sunday and Harvest. I want to be sovereign and no one tells Sundance what to do. So I would say that the government and the feds and John Tory um, should actually be consulting black people and black communities. So not just consulting like placemakers or one individual or two individuals, directly going to black communities like Jane and Finch, like Weston um, and like Scarborough and talking to them and seeing what they need. And many nonprofits have already been doing this. Black Creek Community Farms is in direct contact and direct conversations with their community very, very regularly. So you know what they need. So I would say also consulting nonprofits like Black Creek and like Food Share and PAC to directly work with Black communities. But the biggest thing that I've heard like re repeatedly, like so often, is access to land. Literally access to growing space is all it is so far, so I'm hearing. Um, because when you have land, like Malcolm X says, you have freedom and you have liberation. There is no liberation without land liberation. One cannot stage any political movements, revolutions, no protests without land because land holds the access to food. So that's the most important thing. And I feel like 
honestly, urban planners, zoning, all that stuff needs to get in shape and not be so racist. Um, and then I feel like that could be like a great thing. So that's really what I think. I am not a planner, my best friend is, but I learned a lot from her considering how much that could be done that isn't being done. Um, so that's what I was saying, the macro level, the micro level, so the individual, support black food businesses, support black farmers, support Sundance Harvest. Um, so <laughs> two things like that um, would help a lot because the more you support Sundance Harvest, for example, the more funding I can put into creating new locations, which can train new and more youth um, tens and tens of more youth a year and those youth then start jobs and that's called the closed loop system. The mm -hmm. fact that my business plan right now funnels money into growing the margins means that each year I keep continuing teaching youth for free uh, until there's like tens and tens of Sundance Harvest in Ontario, which is what I want. Um, so that's what I would say is just like support them and also like educate your friends. I actually don't educate anyone on my Instagram besides my learning resource page, which is on my website, um, because I don't have the capacity or emotional availability to do that. So if you wanna learn more about food justice, that's great. Share the knowledge and talk to your friends about that. Open the conversations, especially if you're someone who actually doesn't face any food injustice. Um, that's a really important thing to do. And I would say, if you're looking for somewhere to learn, check out my website, sundanceharvestfarm.com slash learning resources. I have compiled a big page with lots of learning resources about food and land and colonialism and all of that stuff. No, definitely. Uh, so definitely check out that website. So the other program, actually, I wanted you to talk maybe a little bit about is Liberating Lawns. Um, it's a really, really cool project. And I remember reading a bit more about it, too, in the Globe and Mail um, um, earlier in the year. Could you tell us a little bit about Liberating Lawns? Yes. Liberating Lawns is like, I started that during COVID, like the very beginning of COVID, because community gardens were not being open because the city of Toronto does not care about poor people. So it was not being opened at all. And I was like, oh, what are we going to do? Low income people need to grow food because the price of food is rising. Um, so I was like, why don't we just get people with lawns and people who can grow food and just put them together? And then Liberty Lawns was started. And the way it works is it's by neighborhood ward. So I didn't want it to be a big map and someone from Scarborough can farm in Etobicoke. That's great, but they can only do it if they have a car really. So I wanted it to be based on a neighborhood so you literally can walk. So it's more accessible and there's less of a comp competitive nature to it. Um, so it worked really well. I have neighborhood representatives. I have to kind of revamp that program soon with them. And I'm going to really change the structure of them to give neighborhood representatives way more independence and control because I don't like being the boss of really anything. Um, so it's really cool though because with the growers and landholders, basically the growers grow food and they give one third of it um, or even sometimes not even that much of it to the landholder. So you can give 10%, you can give 20%, you can give 30% of the produce each week. Um, and then you have access to the water and the, obviously the space. Um, and as someone who's a grower of Liberty Lawns, you have access to an online database that has lots of information on how to grow food, but you have to have at least one uh, year of growing experience. So many people have taken the program this year and it's been really great. Uh, many of them have grown so many herbs and tomatoes and actually developed a deep bond within their own neighborhood because when you're a grower and landholder, you're probably gonna end up being friends or at least talking to each other. And that way you can actually strengthen your community and create more mutual aid, which I thought was really important in times of COVID. So that's something that I was really excited about Liberty Lawns and it is expanding uh, more in, in different wards in Toronto. And actually there's gonna be a way, this is exciting, Liberty Lawns growers who want to sell their produce because legally you can sell your produce because it's not on city property uh, will be able mm -hmm. to sell it through my new online store that's launching in december i'm launching a very large online store that can highlight many urban farmers all across toronto who want to sell their vegetables uh, because i figured who's going to go to the farmer's market with 10 eggplants probably not a lot of people so if you're a grower in liberty launch and you have like 10 eggplants and you just want to sell them Sell them on Sundance Harvest's online store marketplace, and then you can find uh, someone to buy them. So that's something I'm kind of starting up. It's still in the works. I don't want to tell you too much about it, but <laughs> it's pretty cool. But people can definitely go on the website or follow you on Instagram yeah. to be able to get more updates on, on this yeah. as well. I I'm think watching, it's a really, yeah. 
I think it's a really, really cool and amazing project. And for folks that are, you know, especially folks that do not have access to land to grow uh, food and are looking for land, I think this is a, a great opportunity as well um, to do that. And I love that you've also added it as part of the online store. So folks that are growing even a little bit of food will be able to also earn a bit of money from it. So I think that is, that is amazing. So you talked a lot about all these different programs and activities and things that you're doing. What has been some of the challenges that you face in terms of being able to kind of pull all this together um, um, in a very short period of time, really? Uh, so there's a lot. There's like the macro challenges and the micro challenges, and but there's too many. And my journal knows <laughs> all of them. So I would say the biggest challenge is, of course, systemic racism. I probably would have had a way easier time becoming a farmer if I wasn't black. And that's something that I know because my friends are farmers and they strictly tell me. Um, I know I would have a way easier time probably farming way earlier because I would have more examples of people like me doing it if I wasn't black. Um, so I would say that is the systemic racism that um, affected me ever since I was a kid and very food insecure and didn't have really any access to green space. Um, I could never see myself in nature and which exasperated my mental health and not being happy as a kid and stuff like that uh, with how I was living. So I would say that's the biggest piece. Um, that is the biggest barrier there. And that's why I truly think that when we're thinking about justice and food and all of that great stuff, it's intersectional. Uh, food justice cannot really exist without housing justice. Housing justice cannot exist without um, an ending of sexism. There's these things are all connected because people don't really face one binary issue. For me, I face sexism, I face anti-black racism, I face uh, um, all, all of these other like, different um, isms, right? So it's really important to note that um, yes, food injustice sucks, but if we get rid of that, we still need to get rid of housing injustice because if someone's not properly housed, how are they gonna be able to access affordable food? So I would say that's the biggest issue. The other issue Sundance Harvest obviously got in was access to land. I'm lucky now that Sundance has a bit more clout. <laughs> I'm getting more uh, land access, which is pretty wild. Um, but still, it's still hard because to have Sundance Harvest run the way I want it to run, I, I need at least five locations because I can't keep asking the youth to come from Scarborough to Downsview. That's not fair. I can't keep asking them from Jane and French to come to Downsview. So what Sundance Harvest is primarily working on is to have access to more land and more locations because many of the youth are actually telling me they wanna work at Sundance. So if I have more land, I have more opportunities for them to have more living wage jobs. So I would say those are the two biggest things, but also they're directly linked. Maybe if I had intergenerational wealth or my family was white settlers, I could have had a farm in Guelph that I could move into and retire. That was my great grandfather's farm, but I don't have that. I'm the person in my family that has the most wealth actually for five generations. So that's something really wild considering I'm 23 and I don't have a lot. So I would say that that's obviously a barrier, but that also falls under systemic uh, discrimination and sure. systemic racism. Mm -hmm. No, definitely, definitely. Ooh, um, so what is next for Sundance Harvest? What can we look forward to? I know you touched on some of them, yeah. Uh, but the bits that you could share. Yeah, there's a lot. This um, the, the next three months are probably going to be the most wildest ride of my life. Um, so Sundance Harvest is really, really getting on the train of being multi-locational. By next year, I want at least three no new locations because I'm noticing for the intake of growing in the margins, I, I could only take, accept about 15 participants and I had 80 applications for the fall season. So that many youth need to learn how to farm and need to start their own farms or even work at a farm or start their own food or land sovereignty movements. So I would say more locations is something that Sundance is working really tirelessly hard at because more locations mean more jobs for these youth. More jobs mean they can actually save to start their own farm or just jump off of Sundance and do a project from there. So that's the biggest thing. The second thing is, I'm really happy to announce, Sundance Harvest is going to be opening a production kitchen. I've decided that I grow so many herbs, why don't I just make them into herb salts or salad dressings or anything cool like that? So Sundance Harvest is opening a production kitchen and a food safe kitchen 
in early 2021. And that's a big deal because I can actually let the youth from Growing the Margins use that kitchen because many of them actually want to start their own uh, product, a uh, value-added product line. Some of them want to do herbal uh, teas. Some of them want to make uh, their own cultural foods and just package it and have that there. So I'm really jazzed about that. And that's something that Sundance has always wanted to do. And as I transition more away from growing all the vegetables to just really salad mixes and cherry tomatoes, having a salad dressing line is really important. And of course, for my salad dressing, I'm actually going to be sourcing everything fair trade and ethical. And also I'm sourcing uh, maple syrup from a local indigenous nation. So I'll be incorporating these amazing products by these amazing land stewards in every single one of my products. And I will be making sure that I stick to that. Okay, so what does your team look like? Because this is a lot. So what did you see? How many people? It's just me. How many, how many people are in your team doing all of this? Because I'm yeah. already struggling with the one farm. So I have one staff right now, and I was supposed to hire a bunch more, but COVID hit, and my farm wasn't really... It was, it was a baby, right? So I didn't have a lot of protocols. I didn't have a lot of capacity. Uh, but now that I'm getting used to the new normal, I'm going to be hiring a lot, probably a lot of staff um, near Christmas in January for the new sites, if the sites go through. Um, so, but it's just me really right now and one staff, uh, but I basically do everything. I would say that because my one staff is delivery. Okay. That is a lot. And, 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 and I hope um, I am just every day impressed amazed by all the things that you're doing and and really really honored for the opportunity to get to know you and to learn also from the work that you're doing as well Thank you. um okay so one um last question that i have is what support do you need right now so for people that are tuning in what support what can they do like right now to support sundance harvest so two things you can choose one or the other. Uh, first thing is if you have access to a land resource, whether that be he, um, like a big rural plot of land that you want to put in Sundance's name, or if it's also um, like a piece of land in the city that you have access to that's fairly large, if you have access to land, hit me up because a lot of the growing in the margins use actually want to start their own start their own farm and access to land is a big barrier. So Sundance doesn't really hoard land. It actually, I actually dole it out to many of the youth that take Sundance's programs and many of the new land spots next year are actually going to be incubator farms so they can pilot their projects. So we really need an incubator farm for these youth to pilot their projects. If you don't have access to land, that's okay. If you have access to wealth, you can donate to Sundance Harvest on my website, sundanceharvestfarm.com. Scroll down to the bottom, you'll find the donate button, and that would be really great. Donations, as it says, goes to Growing the Margins, the program that literally jumpstarts so many new projects each year uh, through Sundance Harvest. Well, thank you so much, Cheyenne. Um, congratulations again thank on you. your Eco Hero Award. I hope for more and more awards to come um, in the next few years and, and so that we can honor the amazing work that you're doing. Um, if folks want to uh, find out a bit more about the film festival uh, or about actually about Cheyenne's work, uh, please check Cheyenne, uh, Sundance Harvest on Instagram, Facebook, and also on the website. Um, if you want to find out more about the Planet in Focus Film Festival, please check out planetinfocus.org. Thank you so much, Cyan, for this conversation with me, and congrats again. Thank you, and thank you, Leticia, for hosting this amazing conversation, and thank you for your questions, and of course, thank you, Planet in Focus. All right, thank you. Take care. <laughs>